Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2019 SCCM Congress Co-Chairs. Good morning and welcome to day two of this year's annual Congress. My name is William Dager and I'm here with Steve Greenberg and Lynn Heido as co-chairs of the 2019 SCCM Congress, which will be held in sunny San Diego, California next February. We're looking and working with a talented Congress program committee to put together another great educational program for you. A program that showcases all the latest technologies and the new information that will be available to help us better treat our patients. A program that focuses on a riding wave of change. The Congress Program Committee started developing sessions last fall and even worked on the program this past Saturday. The content we present next year will be offered in environments that will help us best learn, will also get our creative juices flowing, and will allow us to exchange our ideas with each other and with our mentors in critical care. We'll ride the wave of change to work with our teams and to use tools to better serve the field of critical care. Sometimes change is good. The last time the SCCM Congress was in San Diego was our 40th anniversary in 2011. We networked and collaborated with our colleagues around that vast convention center, outside in the perfect San Diego weather, and even on the USS Midway, if you remember that fantastic event. The program you experience next year will be all that you've come to expect from SCCM and more. Come and join us in San Diego in 2019. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gloria Rodriguez Vega. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning Max Harry Wilde's Memorial Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Flavia Machado. Dr. Machado is professor and chair of the intensive care in the Pain, Anesthesiology, and Intensive Care Department at the Federal University at Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is currently the Scientific Director for the Asociado Brasileira de Medicina Intensiva, AMIB. 
She is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Brazilian Research and Intensive Care Network, BRICNET, and also one of the founders and currently the CEO of the Latin American Sepsis Institute, a nonprofit organization devoted to awareness raising, quality improvement, and coordination of multi-center trials in sepsis. She is a member of the executive board of the Global Sepsis Alliance, served on the 2012 and 2016 board of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, and if that isn't enough, she is also a member of the International Sepsis Forum Council. Please join me in welcoming Flavia as she receives the Max Harry Weil Memorial Lecture Award and presents Sepsis, a threat that needs a global solution. And to facilitate the conversation around this topic, um, we are tweeting this session and it's hashtag surviving sepsis, hashtag SCCM live. Flavia? Thank you so much. <laughs> Good morning. Some years ago, this man died in my ICU. I left my hospital and went home because he was the husband of my maid, a lovely woman called Denise that is working with me for the last 20 years, raising my kids, taking care of my home. When I arrived home in the middle of the morning, it was needless to say anything. We start crying. He died from septic shock, and his death was a preventable one. One among millions, millions of deaths that this planet pays to sepsis every year. How many deaths? We don't know. Our best estimates came from this systematic review done by Caroline Fretman that works with Conrad Heinhardt. Revising the literature, they found 27 studies coming from seven high-income countries, an incidence of 260 cases per year, per 100,000 patient inhabitant uh, years, and a mortality rate of 26%. It's from this systematic review that we take all the numbers that we use in our awareness campaigns, six million deaths. However, there is a mathematical problem here. There are 78 high-income countries harboring 1.2 billion lives, where, whereas there are 140 low- and middle-income countries harboring 6.2 billion lives, which means that we should expect 86% of all sepsis cases in the world happening on low- and middle-income countries. But it's not only a mathematical problem. We do have the disparity problem. And just a glance on these slides will show you my point. This is the percentage of GDP spent in health. This is the healthcare access and quality index done by GBDR project. This is mortality, under five mortality. This is data coming from INEC. This is a consortium comprising more than 50 low and middle income countries more than 800,000 patients, and they report healthcare-associated infections. As, as you can see, the numbers coming from these low-resource settings are completely different from the numbers coming from the U.S. And how about prevention? Pneumococcus vaccination. These are the lines for the high-income countries. This is the lines for low- and middle-income countries that are covered by a program called Gavi, an alliance, an international alliance that provides vaccination. 
And this is the line for the middle-income countries that are not eligible for GAVI. So from this, we can easily depict that we cannot estimate world numbers based on high-income country data. But from the other side, the issue is that we do not have quality data coming from low- and middle-income countries. These are the very few studies, multi centered studies, coming from low-resource settings. But we can see from here that the mortality rates are much higher than the 26% found in the systematic review. And there are four studies coming from Brazil that also show much higher mortality rates. However, these studies are not good quality ones. Last year, we had the opportunity to see two very nice studies coming from our settings. One coming from China. These guys rev revised 21,000 charts in Benjim and they found the mortality rate of 54%. And in Brazil, we published last year in Lancet Infectious Disease, the SPREAD study, a one-day prevalence study in 227 Brazilian ICUs, a random sample of 15% of all Brazilian ICUs, both public and private. And what we found, an estimated incidence of 290 cases per 100,000 patient uh, inhabitants, which is higher than the systematic review. And we are talking only about ICU-treated incidents and a mortality rate of 55%. So what we can see from the here is that the 6 million deaths per year is a gross underestimation of the size of the burden of sepsis in our, our planet. Another problem is that we cannot compare low and middle income countries with high income countries. This is not like comparing peers with apples. And actually, we, LMICs, we are not apples. We are much more like a whole fruit salad because we are different among each other. And why do we need these numbers? We need these numbers because we need to have people committed. We need to sensitize all healthcare planners, all budget planners, all people that are, uh, have influential roles in the healthcare system. We need to sensitize them that self sepsis is a global healthcare issue. And how are we not going to get these numbers? Sincerely speaking, in the short term, I think we need some specialized help, and only Hogwarts can help us at this moment. But in the middle term, or in the long term, there are some solutions. First, we can and we need better ICD codes and better ICD coding practices because we do not use what we have. And we need better clinical definitions of sepsis, and we will be back on this in a minute. Global Burden of Disease Report. As you know, GBDR, uh, they only use uh, the underlying cause of death, and they only use the baseline infectious disease process as underlying cause of death. Sepsis is treated in the GBD uh, 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 reports as a garbage code, and it is reassigned for the infectious disease uh, baseline uh, uh, cause, which under, underscores uh, this, the burden of sepsis as it is not reported as sepsis. But the good news is that there is a new project in GBDR, which is run by Christina Rudd uh, to, in the uh, University of Washington with the uh, GBDR project together with uh, University of Pittsburgh, Global Sepsis Alliance, and uh, other people. And um, the aim of this project is to estimate both incidence, prevalence, morbidity, mortality of sepsis based not only in the underlying cause of death, but in the intermediate and in the immediate cause of death. However, there are only few countries in the world that report this intermediate cause of death. However, but this will be enough to model and to estimate uh, uh, the numbers of, of, of sepsis cases 
worldwide. This is very important because it would be one of the first disease in the GBDR project uh, to uh, analyze this intermediate cause of deaths, and we hope to have these first results very soon. We also need to have better electronic uh, charts because this will give us uh, clinical information. However, this is a problem because, as you know, uh, electronic charts are available only uh, in middle-income countries and in high-income countries. But even in middle-income countries, they are restricted to, to the best hospitals and they give us a biased information about our countries. So I would say that in the long term, the best solution is certainly to build research capacity in middle-income countries and low-income countries. And we will have the help of WHO because WHO will start to monitor uh, sepsis all worldwide and this will certainly help in the future. Certainly, there are a lot of factors that affect uh, related to the host, to the pathogen, and to the healthcare system that affects both incidence and mortality of sepsis. And as this is not standardized in all the studies and in all these reports, this certainly precludes uh, the comparison between studies and uh, the data assess assessment. However, uh, it's not only the issue of not getting good data. The issue here is that these factors really affect what we need, which is to reduce sepsis mortality rates. And going back to what Martin Luther King said on 1966, from all sorts of inequality, it's certainly injustice in health, the most shocking and inhumane. He was not referring to sepsis, but his quote, certainly fits well on this disease because disparities are present in most of the factors that affect uh, mortality. Disparities, uh, although highly weighted towards the, the low and middle income countries, uh, plagues the delivery of care everywhere. We are in the most powerful nation of the world, and I'm sure that you face disparities in your daily practices. As it, it has been nicely shown uh, also here in the United States. For instance, uh, in the underserved areas of South Carolina, mortality rates are higher. Uninsured patients have received fewer interventions, have shorter ICU and hospital stays and have higher mortality rates. Some researchers have already demonstrated that at least partially racial disparities might be explained by the fact that black people are admitted in hospitals with lower quality of care. And also social economical status measured by the mean income uh, has been associated with uh, higher mortality rates, not only in the US, but also in Denmark. But certainly disparities are much present between high-income countries and low-income countries. And going back to Alvaro's history, the disparities, the inadequacies of his treatment led to his death. Alvaro, has been had tuberculosis, and he was treated in one of the nicest public teaching hospitals in Sao Paulo, because it was his, the referral hospital for the place where he lives in the city. One day, he woke up confused. He had fever the day before. He was speaking nonsense. So his family brought him to the hospital, to the emergency department. After hours of waiting, in a very quick interview with the ED physician, he was discharged with the diagnosis of an acute psychiatrist disorder. And he was oriented to seek for an outpatient consultation with a psychiatrist. Not only, to, not only mentioning the missed diagnosis of a sepsis-induced encephalopathy, can you imagine how long does it take in my country to get a psychiatrist consultation in the public system? Months. The family took it for granted, believe it, 
and went home. Why? Low lay people awareness. The family never knew that a severe infection could cause confusion. And this is usual in Brazil. I'm not aware about any low and middle income country that has a survey about low lay people awareness, but we did it. LASI, Latin American Sepsis Institute, we uh, had this survey done by one of these big companies that do election surveys in Brazil, and we asked 2,000 people in 134 cities all around Brazil, and only 7% of the Brazilians have heard the word sepsis, although 98% of them have heard the word myocardial infarction. And these numbers are completely different from the numbers of the high-income countries. And as you can see, the rate between German and Brazil is 7 to 1, which, which brings us bad memories, by the way. <laughs> but we can change these numbers. Some years ago, Global Sepsis Alliance, as you know, launched the World Sepsis Day. And we're doing great things all around the world, including Brazil. We have a Facebook page with more than 53,000 likers. We do videos, we do cartoons, we do a lot of activities on the World Sepsis Day, not only in Brazil, but everywhere. You have here Sepsis Alliance, Robbie Stentos Foundation that are doing a great job. And these numbers are changing. As you can see here, in Brazil, last year, we repeated the survey, and we have 100% improvement, and we beat the Germans. <laughs> <coughs> On that day, in DED, it wasn't only a problem with the family. Certainly, we have a problem with healthcare uh, professionals' knowledge, as you certainly know. We had a survey done by LASI some years ago, and half of the physicians didn't know the concept of severe sepsis by that time. And this would, uh, you have other examples of this, for instance, coming from Malawi, from Turkey, and also here in the US. We know that this is a huge problem, and a lot of things are being doing about this. For instance, so SCCM and ZICMI is doing a great job with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Great, great, great job. Thank you, SCCM. Thank you, ZICMI, for all what has been done about the Surviving Sepsis Campaign since 2004. But also, there are not, not other initiatives like this in Uganda, using WHO EMI Quick Check which is not only for sepsis, it's for severely ill patients. And this paper coming from Uganda has clearly shown that training physicians, uh, with training, you will be able to uh, detect these patients much earlier. Or for instance, Alima, a nurse working on Nigeria, training nurses to detect septic patients. And us in the Global Sepsis Alliance, this is the World Sepsis Congress that we did in 2016. It's a completely web Congress. We had more than 15,000 registers in the first version. All the, all the lectures are made available, freely available in the internet, and they have been accessed more than 55,000 times. And as you can see, half of the registrants were from low and middle income countries, and more than half were non-physicians. And people were like this making meetings to, ass to, to, to assist the Congress and making all the efforts to get access to the internet. And last year, we did the spotlight, a joint meeting with WHO. 70% of the attendees were from no and middle income countries, and again, more than half were non-physicians. This year, we are planning the second World Congress. Uh, this is gonna be, again, all web-based, more than 100 speakers from all around the world. On the next day, Inez called me. I wasn't on the city. Inez regretted until today that she didn't call me in the first day. Alvaro was not good, and I told her, bring him immediately to my hospital. I phoned the chief of the emergency department and asked him for help. 
I told him, I think he has sepsis. And even this, besides all this, besides the fact that I work in a university hospital and my hospital have a sepsis protocol implemented in DED, it took over much more than one hour to receive the first shot of antibiotics. He deteriorated. He was intubated in DED. He uh, needed vasopressors and mechanical ventilation. This is inadequate quality of care. On the spread study that I just showed you, we were unable to show a difference in a random sample of Brazilian intensive care units between public and private institutions. However, this is LASI database. We are training institutions in Brazil since 2005. Our database now has more than 50,000 patients, and we published the first part of it in critical, in critical care medicine last year. And as you can see, the upper line is the public institutions, and they were not able to sustain a reduction in mortality rates. And the, the line below is the, uh, from the private institutions, and they were able to reduce nicely the mortality rates. Quality improvement is the best option for resource poor settings, and we need to detect and to know what are the barriers and what are the facilitators, because we need the line that is below and not the upper line. We don't know exactly why this happened, but there are many potential reasons. We are not treating the same population in public and private institutions in Brazil. The public system, the, the population from the public system does not have the same quality of healthy as in the private system. And there is delay in searching for care. The emergency uh, departments are much more crowded. There is shortage of healthcare workers. There is shortage of resource and shortage of ICU beds. And we need to find this out because we also had the opportunity to demonstrate in a subset of our private institutions that our implementation process is cost saving. We are not only in these 3,000 patients on this study saving lives, we are saving money. So there is no reason why we could not apply this in many more hospitals. On that day in DED, Alvaro had to wait many, many hours to get an ICU bed because we didn't have any free available beds for him. This is a huge problem in Brazil because we have disparities. If you are covered by the public system, this is your map. If you are covered by the private system, this is your map. And they are completely different. And they are different inside the country. If you are in the poorest part of the country, on the north, you're gonna have much less beds for you both in the private, uh, in, the, in the public system. So, and of course, this is a much better situation in Brazil than for instance, in Africa. In Zambia, there is a single ICU bed with 10 beds for the whole country, for 13 million people. And we are not only talking about ICU beds, we are talking about what an ICU bed represents. We know replacement therapy, mechanical ventilation, all the life support measures that we can offer to our patients. And we cannot, and we, we don't need to go so far. Let's talk about the first item of the sepsis bundle, lactate sample. In Uganda, 90% of the institutions never have lactate, which is true for 40% of all Africa, at least on this study. And it is true for 60% of the institutions in Mongolia. This is what we are facing in these low resource settings. People are sharing the same oxygen and sharing this sort of ventilation equipment. And how about us, an upper middle income country 
a rich economy like Brazil. When we did spread, we asked them, please tell us, do you have, always have, these eight items that we feel are necessary to comply with the six-hour bundle? And we consider as a lower viability institution if they have at least six of these items. And we were not surprised to see that our public institutions, 32% of them, were lower viability ones. And in our multivariated analysis, being in a lower viability institution was associated with a 2.6 higher risk of death. We, in our federal university, we are a lower viability institution. And Alvaro was with us. This leads us to the issue that low and middle resource settings, low and middle resource countries like us, we need specific guidelines. We need to think what we can do with our patients because we are different. And this also leads us to this question. In that day, in the emergency department, did Alvaro really had, have sepsis? Well, it depends. If you're using the broad sepsis tree definition, the answer is yes. Because Alvaro had a life-threatening organ dysfunction associated with a dysregulated uh, ROS response to infection. However, if you strict to the clinical definition of sepsis, the answer is no. Why? Because he had a Glasgow Coma score of 14. And a Glasgow Coma score of 14 is a SOFI score of 1. And even if his Glasgow Coma was 13, it was still a SOFI score of 1. And this does not qualify him to the diagnosis of sepsis. And even if it wasn't a Glasgow Coma score, but rather hypotension, he would not qualify for the current definition of sepsis. Because hypotension is SOFI score of one. So, but okay, if his bilirubin was two, he would have sepsis. Because bilirubin of two is a SOFI score of two. So there is a problem with this variation in SOFI score of two to define sepsis. Because a big part of this planet do not have access to labs, but everyone can calculate a SOFI score, a, a Glasgow Coma score. And almost everyone can measure pressure. And you are under scoring the clinical manifestations of sepsis, which, by the way, based on data, were exactly the ones who were selected as, as able to predict death and were put on the Q SOFA score, which means that makes no sense not to define sepsis by the presence of Glasgow Coma score and hypotension. Or we might say, no, you are making some confusion, Flavia. What is important is that the bedside a physician will see the patient and will see, oh, can treat the patient, even if it does not qualify for the definition of sepsis. And I will say, we need a definition that can be used at bedside. We need a definition that we can teach our students at bedside. And this definition is not for this. And they are saying that this definition is good for epidemiological purpose and for research. And I would say that our main objective as healthcare workers, it's not doing research and it's not doing epidemiological studies and actually is taking care of our patients at bedside. 
Second point. The second problem is that if this definition is good for epidemiological purpose, we do have a problem because for the definition of septic shock, we need lactate. And as I just showed to you, there are a lot of places in this planet that cannot measure lactate. So we will have problems with the epidemiological objective because we are not going to make the diagnosis of septic shock if you don't measure lactate. And the third problem is the Q-SOFA. Q-SOFA is, is a severity score. And unfortunately, there was a misunderstanding of this uh, proposal. And Q-SOFA is being used as a screening tool. As we know, severity score is chosen based on the best balance between sensitivity and specificity. And to use something as a screening tool uh, in a deadly disease like sepsis, we do need a uh, tool that has much more sensitivity. And a lot of papers have been already showing that uh, QSOFA has low sensitivity, and we do show that this is unpublished data coming from LASI database. We asked our institutions to collect prospectively QSOFA before the diagnosis of sepsis, meaning patients with organ dysfunction according to the definition of the surviving sepsis campaign. And we have data from 5,000 patients now. And I can tell you that 62% of these 5,000 patients are QSOFA negative. They don't have two of the three components of the Q-SOFA. And their mortality rate when they are Q-SOFA negative in the private institutions in Brazil is 7 and 15%. But I already told you that the private institutions in LASI database are not translating our reality. What translates better our reality are the public institutions, which means that this is much better to translate. 34% mortality rate, with your QSOFA zero and 40%. So at least in our settings, to use QSOFA to screen for sepsis, which will mean that you're gonna miss 62% of the patients and they will die in 40% of the case. Could we have prevent Alvaro's death? That's a good question. Alvaro died less than 48 hours after being admitted to our hospital. And we isolated in his blood a pneumococcus. He had pneumonia. In Brazil, we do have a very good public uh, vaccination program, but pneumococcus vaccine is very expensive. So only those with more than 60 years old uh, have access to it, which was not the case of Alvaro. I am the mother of two teenagers, which were vaccinated when they were very young because I paid for it. But Alvaro, he did not have this chance. Sepsis is at least partially a preventable disease. We can prevent sepsis by preventing infection. But as Jerry addressed yesterday, we also can prevent sepsis by dia diagnosis, diagnosing infection earlier. And uh, we think that we need very sensitive screening tools for that. And last but not least, if Alvaro hadn't died, would he have received support in Brazil as a survival? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Not specifically. We, we don't have in our public system anything for critical care survivals. And uh, I congratulate SCCM for the TREE program, which is now, I know, far beyond the U.S. borders. But I also congratulate people from Uganda. They have this program, Smart Discharge, which is wonderful. The mortality rate for kids after discharge in Uganda is after 30, within 30 days of discharge is as high as in, ho in the hospital. And they developed this uh, app. They detect which are the predictors for early death, and they developed this app which can detect which are the high-risk kids, and they follow these kids. And this program are uh, reducing the mortality rates uh, not very nicely. Well, all the points that I addressed here are quite important. They are fundamental in our fight against sepsis. Uh, this is certainly a threat 
that needs a global solution. And all these points are very important. Some years ago, Global Sepsis Alliance put together a group of uh, people uh, with the objective to get political uh, support. Our aim was to sensitize uh, healthcare ministers of many countries because we need WHO uh, to address the sepsis issue. And on May last year, we got a new player on this game, a very strong player, a global player. As you know, on May last year, WHO approved a new resolution on prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of sepsis. And all, everything that we discussed here are addressed on this resolution. And uh, I think that this will not lead us to the victory on this war, but will certainly help us to win many of our battles. We are now lobbying WHO to get a global action plan for sepsis, uh, as we have this global action plan for antimicrobial resistance, with all the objectives, all the stakeholders, and all the roles very well defined. This might not be of utmost importance for the developed world, because you will, will develop your national action plans uh, regardless of the fact that there is a global action plan. But for the developing world, this is m m very important, because we need WHO to put our governments under pressure. I don't believe that our government, that Brazil and all the middle and low income countries will develop our own national action plans if there is no global action plan. And there are a lot of things going on. For instance, WHO had uh, uh, put a group of experts uh, on January on Geneva to discuss all these aspects and, uh, uh, and trying to uh, settle uh, the plans for the na next uh, five years. And uh, there were experts from all around the world. It was a quite balanced uh, uh, panel and uh, something very interesting happened. There, there was a guy from Africa over there and uh, there were a lot of discussion about the low resource settings. And uh, in one of the moments, in one of the workshops that I was moderating, this guy said, oh, oh, I'm sorry to go back again to this low resource setting issue. And I told him, why you are apologizing? We are 85% of the burden of sepsis. So it is expected that most part of the discussion is on us. You are an African, an African representative in a double age old meeting. Do not apologize. And I think that sepsis quite nicely represents the equity dilemma. Should we seek for new tools, new technology devices that will enable us to detect an infective agent a couple of hours earlier, while thousands, millions of people in the low resource settings have never heard about sepsis and thus do not seek for care? Should we spend millions of dollars trying to find a new vasopressor while millions of people in Africa have no access to any vasopressor? All this innovation, all these tools are very costly. And even if they prove effective, it's hardly, they hardly will help the massive numbers of patients that need them. However, in terms of equity, it is equally important to improve the care for those who need in the developed world, as it is to find inexpensive therapies and new strategies of quality improvement for those who live in the resource limiting settings. The global solution should be tracked in both directions 
And the problem is that the current pathway is unbalanced on the direction of the developed world needs. And I think that WHO will help to put us on the track and to find us the balance. And we, as the communities, should help us also to find the balance. Oops. Sorry. I haven't, say, say, uh, I haven't said thanks to SCCM for inviting me on the beginning of my talk because I wanted to say it now. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for hearing us. Our voices are not powerful ones, but they need to be heard. We don't have a lot of papers in New England or in JAMA. Some of us never publish a paper that it's in PubMed, but we are experts. We are experts in our own reality, and we are the best. Ah, we could not save Alvaro. We could not bring him back to his family. But we could save many. We could save Alexandre, that spent two months in our ICU and came back to say hello to our residents. And we could save so many. And I think that we should focus our attention in transforming each of our patients in survivors. And trying to do this to every patient, to every moment in our lives. Trying to do there a better place. Trying to transform our world in a better world forever and doing our best. And uh, certainly trying to reach uh, what is written in the, the Global Sepsis Alliance website. A world free of sepsis, a world free of preventable deaths. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in the exhibit hall for a refreshment break.